hello everyone and thanks for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm super pumped to be here uh, to talk about uh, VMware technology. And uh, my name is Anand Trinivas. Uh, just a bit of background about myself. Uh, I came into VMware through the Nyansa acquisition where I was the co-founder or one of the co-founders and the CTO there. Uh, before uh, Nyansa, I was at a software defined networking startup called Plexi where we built data center optical switches um, and before Plexi, I was at a cellular wireless company called Irvana. Um, so I've kind of been all over the, the map on, on networking. And finally, before that, I did my PhD at MIT, focusing on wireless networking and algorithms. So just a bit of background about myself. But now as part of VMware, I'm here to talk about how healthcare IT needs comprehensive IoT operational assurance. That's sort of the title and the premise of the talk. So with that, let me kick it off. Um, what is IoT operational assurance? Let's just start there. IoT security plus IoT performance is IoT operational assurance. So in healthcare, we're talking about devices like infusion pumps, um, glucometers, MRI machines, and, and the like. And obviously, you know, the most secure device you can have is a device that you just unplug, put in the corner in some closet, and it'll be very secure, but it won't be very useful. So operational assurance is all about the fact that we need to first make sure that the device can connect to its application and perform its business function. And then obviously we also need to make sure that it's secure, that it's talking to the set of sites that it's supposed to be talking to, that it is, um, that it, you know, it's, it's not doing anything uh, that, it, that it's not supposed to be doing. So both of these two things combined make up IoT operational assurance. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about. That's so critical. And one of the more important problems that healthcare IT needs to solve. So just to kind of add a little bit more uh, motivation to the problem, this was a survey done by Bain uh, around CIOs and folks like that around healthcare to talk about what the top barriers to IoT adoption were in, in healthcare. And the two most common answers were security concerns. And the second point about the difficulty in integrating IT with operational technology. So this is sort of another way of talking about sort of assurance. But the second point is really important, which is that historically, a lot of IoT devices have operated on a dedicated OT or an operational technology network, which is completely separate, separately managed. Um, you know, your bedside monitors and telemetry devices and things like that are operating in a completely se segmented way from the rest of your IT network. And that's obviously a very inefficient process and also something that doesn't jive well with sort of unifying all of your devices, management, security, et cetera. And so in terms of bringing those OT networks into the IT network, a big problem statement is how do we make sure that performance is still guaranteed um, for these devices? And then similarly, how do we guarantee that security is also maintained for these devices? And again, that goes back to the notion of IoT operational assurance, which combines both, both of these facts. The other side of this is the fact that this now brings multiple groups together as well and requiring unified views into IT or into IoT devices for IT departments and IT operations, engineering, service desk, folks like that. OT, so people like the biomedical group that actually own the devices um, or facilities that own IoT devices like smart lights or security cameras and things like that, as well as obviously cybersecurity that cares about you know, the, the, the security of these devices as well. So pulling in all three of these groups, giving sort of unified insight into making sure that um, uh, these devices can perform and are secure. So one more click into um, you know, what IoT operational assurance is all about. Um, where it starts is first and foremost, just even identifying these devices. So what is actually running on my network and where is it located? 
So it's one thing to talk about, you know, I have this many different MAC addresses and IP addresses on my network. It's another thing to talk about, this is an Alaris infusion pump with this model. This is an Abbott glucometer of this model. This is a Philips MRI machine of this model and so on. It's located in the NICU because it's connected to this particular access point. It's located in this other room because it's wired into this particular switch port and so on. So what devices, what, what's the identity of the devices? Where are they located? And you know, a, a use case that kind of goes along with this is also, are they even being used, right? How much are my devices even being used? Uh, this part of it tells you that. The next part of it is the performance aspect. So the, the idea of just, can this device even connect to the network? And can it connect to its application? Can my infusion pump connect to the infusion pump server um, and actually you know, get, get the data that it needs to, needs to get to perform its uh, business function? The next aspect of this is baselining. So the notion, both from a performance standpoint, but also from a behavioral standpoint, you know, you're you know, using the infusion pump example again, infusion pumps shouldn't be talking to Facebook and Google and whatever else. Um, they should just be talking to a very specific set of destinations, which might include things like your radius server, DNS server, DHCB server, and infusion pump server, and that's about it, right? And so because of that, it has these IoT devices tend to have predictable behavior that machine learning can automatically learn what normal behavior looks like and can then figure out you know, whether any kind of deviation has occurred with these devices and, and be able to alert and, and take action based on that. Which sort of brings us to the next section, which is mitigation. Once, once any kind of deviation from normal behavior is detected, what are some of the actions that can be taken? So from a security standpoint, if a device all of a sudden tar starts talking to random destinations that it shouldn't be, then you know, programming the network access controller or programming the SD-WAN router in order to be able to deny or quarantine or restrict access or whatever have you for these devices is going to be important. The other side of it is from a performance standpoint. If devices all of a sudden aren't having good performance on the network, if either they can't connect or let's say, um, an MRI machine is trying to transfer, you know, large image files to a PAX server. You know, is that happening efficiently? What are some of the actions that can take? Well, SD WAN, for example, can dynamically optimize application performance to sort of mitigate that kind of problem as well. And then finally, on the prevention side, we're talking about ensuring the right security policies, um, like segmentation, as an example, or micro segmentation to ensure that devices are you know, securely configured and um, you know, we can avoid any, any problems going forward. So with that, this is gonna be my last slide of the first part of this, where you know, just at a high level, I wanna introduce the fact that at VMware, we have three products that sort of fit into solving the IoT operational assurance problem. And one, the first product um, is SD-WAN, Right, so VMware SD-WAN, which obviously connects IoT devices that are on the left of this picture, um, you know, in campuses, clinics, branches, and so on, to their applications. So there's SD-WAN and optimizes their application performance. Then there's edge network intelligence, which is the analytics layer on top of all of this, which actually is able to identify IoT devices, baseline their behavior, figure out when there are any kind of problems. And then finally, there's SASE, which is Secure Access Services Edge, which adds additional layer, an additional layer of security services that IoT devices can go through, sort of similar to what user devices would go through, um, all offered as a service in order to ensure their secure behavior. So with that, what I want to do is sort of finish off this part and kind of open it up um, just to see if you guys agree, disagree on the importance of the problem to healthcare IT, you know, how you guys see um, the solutions and just kind of open up for general discussion. Regarding the 
large number of IoT devices that you see in a healthcare environment. Um, fingerprinting these can be difficult sometimes because they have a high degree of security in order to make sure that the data that's contained on them is not capable of being misused. Do you work closely with the manufacturers of these devices to have access through APIs or possibly even get some kind of fingerprinting capabilities so that the, uh, the system isn't having to do a lot of extra legwork for no reason? Yeah, we, we do. Uh, obviously, the default sort of stance is that, you know, without, because obviously new manufacturers, new devices are constantly coming online. So you have to have some base way of being able to identify a device that you've never seen before, sort of using signatures like, you know, host name, you know, destinations, that destination addresses talk to, OUI, like the manufacturer of the device, uh, the types of protocols that the device talks, the patterns that it uses to talk and so on. So you have to have a base layer of that that applies across the board, but obviously for specific devices, um, you know, GE is a good example that we have a very deep partnership to really identify exactly what those devices are. And so pretty detailed information around you know, software version, serial number, and things like that, uh, that where basically the manufacturer helps us in terms of providing us that extra data. But by default, the idea is that we need to identify it on its own. And actually just a quick you know, adder to that point that I forgot to mention, is that typically with IoT devices, especially in healthcare, and I mean, this is general as well, you're not gonna be able to put an agent on these devices. So you don't have that aspect of being able to sort of leverage that for identification or any kind of assurance. And so you have to do it with observation and behavioral analysis. And that's where sort of this kind of system comes in. Okay. Yeah, so I had a, a kind of a similar question. It, it was more related to the, uh, the, uh, the AI part, the, the behavioral detection somehow, as well as the, the profiling. Uh, is that something that you're working on as well with the vendors or uh, what do you, you, do you have a kind of a baseline as well to, to get started with or is there a certain amount of time which needs to be taken in consideration before you start, you know, reporting on behavior? Yeah, so the way the identification engine works is uh, we call it a hierarchical AI powered identification mechanism, where the idea is the minute we see the device, there's obviously certain things that you can tell about it. You know who the OUI, the manufacturer of it is, you know some basic data about, about what it is. But for a lot of these devices, you don't actually know their identity until you see their behavior. And you can start to look at, well, wait a minute, this particular device is talking to these destinations using these protocols and now we can identify it more certainly rather than an OUI, we can actually call that a Honeywell barcode scanner with this model or something like that, right? Uh, because of sort of observing it over a longer period of time. So the, the, the identification engine sort of works in this way. It also works in the way of looking at devices that behave similarly and trying to cluster together like devices. So let's take a device that we've never seen before, like somebody deploys like a new type of, um, you know, glucometer or something like this. But all of those glucometers have, you know, this like a similar set of OUIs, a similar set of destination, you know, addresses, a similar set of host names or a pattern with host names or something like that. That's something we can automatically pick up as a new potential IoT family or an IoT device family that now we can actually label. And so that's sort of how the system works in general. And you know, as I was saying earlier, we do work with the manufacturers as well to try and get any additional data. You know, it's always better to have better data than better algorithms, <laughs> right? Um, the algorithms are useful as in, you know, you need to have a default thing where you don't have a relationship with the manufacturer or that a device has just come out that you'd never knew before. But you know where where you can get better data. It's it's always beneficial. Yeah, hey, Anand, this is uh, Greg Stewart, uh, blog at vdestination.com. A uh, question I had was based around security, and I'm going to be uh, the devil's advocate here. So, uh, as far as security is concerned, like we talk about IoT, especially in the medical in the medical space, how is it that um, all of this stuff is handling like HIPAA compliance? Um, how is it that we're making you know? 
medical organizations feel warm and fuzzy about these technologies and and telehealth in general, I guess. But it's yep. it's 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 trending that way. And with the COVID pandemic, it's going to be you know more and more individuals are going to opt to just not go in, but instead do things over the over the web or over the phone. I'm just I'm I'm wondering from your perspective, like how is HIPAA compliance handled in these uh, in these places? Yep. No, no, that's, that's, that's a great question. And so I think the key thing, you know, how we think about it, at least at, at VMware, is that we want to give customers flexibility in terms of deployment models. So one thing is, well, actually, let me step back for a sec. First things first, what data do we collect? Um, and we're sort of very crystal clear that we actually don't collect any kind of patient data. So that's the first step. All of this is based on network analytics based on mostly network metadata, which we spell out exactly what kind of metadata that's collected, and it doesn't include patient data. So that's, that's for, for starters. The second point is giving customers flexibility in how they deploy the, the architecture. And so from a edge network intelligence analytics side of uh, things, customers can deploy this as a private cloud deployment where they control all the data in their own data center. So that's sort of one, one, one option in, the, in that way as well. For the SD-WAN and SASE side of things, now obviously there is an internet element of that where, you know, especially if they use our gateways, which I'll get into more detail about, to sort of on-ramp onto the internet and stuff like that. There is the aspect of, you know, data going through a cloud service in that way, but that's where certifications and things like that uh, that we have here at VMware Come into the uh, come into the fore and sort of you know strict adherence to HIPAA guidelines and things like that uh, sort of allow that, but that's that's kind of how I'd, how I'd answer that. Hey Nand, um, my name is Bruno Wallman. Um, I blog at uh, brunowallman.com. I have questions about bidirectional communication when it comes to uh, security. Um, with the sheer number of IoT devices that can be. In, in healthcare in a hospital, there's gonna be lots, lots of messages, some automation needed around that. Are you tying into um, existing uh, security systems that are out there for reporting? And also these IoT systems may have their own vendor supplied uh, management systems. Is there bi-directional communication to supply that security information when something is uh, communicating out of the norm? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So obviously, exactly how you point out, Bruno, like security is is not done sort of by one system and in kind of a vacuum. Um, the systems that everybody already has, like a network access control or a radius server or a firewall, obviously, or a SIM that sort of aggregates all this data together. Integration with those systems is key. And that's how we sort of look at look at the world as well. So from an edge network intelligence standpoint, which is actually another thing I, I forgot to mention, it's multi-vendor, that part of it, sort of integrations with systems like, you know, Cisco ICE, as an example, which does, which, which does network access control for, for devices at the edge, you can actually integrate directly from, from the platform and take action from the platform, and it can automatically take action as well. Integrations with SIMs like Splunk, uh, or ArcSight or things like that, where our system sends syslog, for example, to in order to let them know that, hey, this anomaly has occurred. Now that SIM or that SOAR can sort of correlate that with other data sources that it has access to is another element of this. And then it can sort of turn around and take action as well. And then in terms of the detailed integrations with manufacturers, that's where it's sort of, it's, it's on a strategic, basis. So GE, I mentioned, is one manufacturer with a very close relationship, but there are other manufacturers that we're working to have that kind of relationship with as well, where we would start to sort of integrate directly there and sort of enact, um, enact action, mitigation actions um, uh, on that front as well. You mentioned uh, micro-segmentation and also talked about Cisco ICE and NAC solutions. Um, you know, it's one one thing to do uh, micro segmentation through the WAN. Uh, yep. How do you integrate with the internal networking system to make sure that right from the access layer through the WAN, what, what kind of plugins do you have there for various uh, networking vendors to make that work? 
Yeah, for the most part, our integrations are via systems like a NAT, right? So we wouldn't directly go and program a switch to say, okay, this is the segmentation that you should apply. We would just tell the NAC that, hey, these devices need to be segmented away from these other devices, this application from this other application and so on. And then the NAC would sort of take care of the programming of switches, wireless controllers, APs, whatever else, right? So that's on the network access side. On the WAN side, obviously, you know, I'll talk about sort of SD-WAN or VMware SD-WAN more uh, in the next presentation. But on the WAN side, the system does segmentation, micro-segmentation itself. So there's programmability embedded with SD-WAN that edge network intelligence would, would integrate with on, on that side.